Evil Within is a game that I believe has a lot of potential. It has unique monsters, ideas, and numerous creative possibilities, and yet it has always dropped the ball when it comes to polish. And with enough minor problems, you start wondering if they're relying on the Kool-Aid being a part of their team to overlook these issues. Here are some of the problems I feel are plaguing this franchise, and how I believe Tango Works can absolve key features within the series to create a better sequel, especially now that they are bought out by Microsoft. The story for The Evil Within is given as much emphasis as the gameplay. Why Detective Castellanos would willingly holster a gun and plunge himself into hordes of enemies requires reasonable motivation. In the first game, there are scenes all over the place, but nothing to connect the narrative together, at least not without researching and pondering for hours on end and spending more time than necessary on the wiki. Yet even with a ridiculous amount of reflection, there's not enough of a central idea to piece together the plot no matter how formulaic writers think people's lives are. The only context given is STEM was built by Ruvik, and the rest of these characters, whether they are scientists, allies, or double agents, are involved in some way, shape, or form. Transitions from one point of interest to another are mundane, since everything can be referred back to the central idea that it's a dream sequence that exists within the context of some lunatic's mind. While The Evil Within 2 has more consistent story structuring, it created new issues in the process. Stefano, the first major villain of the game, was an interesting character. Not particularly unique, but interesting enough to build upon considerably. But he hardly has anything to tie the plot of the first game, other than being another crazy guy who took over STEM, because the incompetence of Mobius is apparently legendary. Halfway through the plot, this antagonist is sacrificed for a new villain, Theodore, who barely has any character besides being a bad guy. What exactly was the point of doing this? Yet, these are the lucky ones. For the rest of the cast, calling them characters is a very generous title. As I mentioned before, the main antagonist of the game is an organization named Mobius. But the player has no idea what they and their people do, how they function, or what sort of power they have. And what exactly happened to Sebastian's partner Joseph, or the main antagonist of the first game, Ruvik, is glossed over entirely in the sequel. Lily, who is the fundamental reason for Sebastian's return to STEM, is hardly even present in the story. We know nothing about her besides she's just the protagonist's child in need of rescuing, who from the looks of the ending hasn't suffered any mental trauma despite being exposed to this. <laughs> This, or this. You must learn. The player doesn't even gain the opportunity to learn about the leader of Mobius, not even so much as his name, and now he's dead. So, number one, give characters character, then give them character arcs, and then keep character development of character arcs consistent for all involved parties to keep the story engaging. I mean, this is writing basics 101, people. I'm not asking for pioneering in literature. Without going too far out of my comfort zone with game development and programming lingo, all that needs to be said is Bethesda and the creation engine. And because of this ridiculous engine, the mechanics of the first game were unpolished to say the least. Control of Sebastian felt as if he had the weight of a feather being blown around on an ice rink. Oftentimes, glitches would occur where Sebastian would have trouble climbing objects or jumping over certain obstacles unless he was in the perfect spot. These glitches were never corrected in The Evil Within 2, though with Microsoft buying out Bethesda, my hope is that they will stop relying on the engine that has caused their games to lack polish. This is a pet peeve of mine, when the partial challenge of the game is fighting the camera. These issues are few and far between, but consistent enough to irritate the player. The primary problem in The Evil Within 2 was aiming with the handgun. Now perhaps this is not the fault of the camera, but rather the control itself. After discussing with some colleagues, most of us felt like there was a deep learning curve to using the standard handgun. This alongside each gun having a different field of view disorients the player when switching from weapon to weapon. 
Depending on the armament selected, oftentimes the camera would be too close to the back of Sebastian's head, perpetuating the issue. And when you can die in a few hits from one zombie alone, mastery over weapon controls is critical. Resident Evil 4 mechanics felt more natural no matter what weapon was equipped. Of course, each gun had its own aiming style, but these differences were minuscule enough to keep a sense of familiarity, but prominent enough to have distinct advantages and drawbacks. Sneaking around is a pain at times, since when Sebastian hides behind an object, the player can snap to cover. But the snapping feature is finicky at best, and as I've mentioned before, it doesn't always respond to your inputs, which is kind of a problem when trapped in rooms with an enemy that can't be killed. Another issue is when hiding in tall bushes, the player loses sight of Sebastian relative to the environment entirely. This is an inherently problematic design choice for obvious reasons. The Evil Within has some absolutely ludicrous boss mechanics that rely far too much on instant game overs. While this issue was corrected in The Evil Within 2, one boss in particular was left unpolished. Three guesses who? Honestly, the O'Neill boss fight did not fit with the theme of the game. I mean, you have these uncanny monstrosities and then this random guy with a flamethrower. The main issue with this boss is that he has no weaknesses, at least not any that the player could build their strategy around. The closest thing to a weakness that I could find was the vulnerability to stealth attacks, but there's no indication when or how it will work. Sometimes you can sneak up on him and other times he is inadvertently aware of you without any reason as to why. This ends up putting the player in a difficult situation, making them open to mega life draining attacks, and if your health is low enough, an instant game over attack. Cinematic bars as compensation for beating the game. This is what you call replay value? What were they thinking? Other than this, a successful run is awarded with outfits, and before you ask, no, the Magnum was not a decent reward, as you had the option to use one in the first game's first run. The Brass Knuckles, on the other hand, are only unlockable after a second run on Nightmare Mode. Adding features such as a Target Mode that allows you to unlock extra upgrades like a Tactical Vest or an Infinite Ammo option, it would easily give players a reason to pick up a controller either immediately or a few months down the line. I can't begin to tell you how many times I've returned to Resident Evil 4 in the past 10 years, as there are so many weapon and upgrade combinations to keep the game fresh. All games have minor problems that annoy us, and sometimes what we really need is to adapt to the learning curve instilled by the programmers. All things considered, if The Evil Within 3 were to refine a few of these issues even slightly, we could ultimately have a more memorable gaming experience. But that's just one man's opinion, and what do I know? Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed the video, then use your reticle to hit that rectangular red button below to test your hand-eye coordination.